chapter four. The name of this chapter, chemical bonding, ionic bond model, is probably the best they could do because there's more to it than that. We we get into some other things in the chemical bonding in this chapter, and then we finish it out with chapter five on the covalent bonding model. But in this chapter, we're going to use the ionic bonding model to uh, name compounds, actually. <clears throat> All right. So we don't need to dwell on this. It's just an outline of the subjects we're going to cover today. Oops. So what is a chemical bond? That question has been plaguing chemists for centuries. The best explanation for the chemical bond came from Linus Pollock, who in 1954 got a Nobel Prize for his work on just that topic. And this is the wording that they used in the prize. <clears throat> the nature of the chemical bond. In fact, he published a book. There, there are two types of scientists. Lastly, they, they sort of blend together. Most scientists are analytical. In other words, they tear nature down and try to figure out the parts. But occasionally, you get one who has an aptitude for synthesizing putting all that information together into a, a coherent uh, theory. And Linus Pauling was one of those. So <clears throat> in short, we could say that the chemical bond is um, a description of the force that holds two atoms together. It has to be uh, preferred by those two atoms. In other words, they don't bond for no reason. There has to be a reason for their bonding and, and we'll uh, approach that topic as we proceed. But when you think about a chemical bond, you have uh, two atoms coming together and ask yourself, what do they see first? Uh, as they approach, the first thing that interacts is electrons. Right? The nuclei don't get close enough to interact. It's the electrons that are instrumental in bonding uh, two atoms together. So we have, actually we have uh, three uh, divisions of chemical bonds. The ionic bond, and we'll define these in detail later, except for the last one. Ionic bonding and covalent bonding. The metallic bond is a special case that we're not going to get into here. <clears throat> it requires a little more chemistry than we've got time to discuss. So we're going to focus on ionic bonding and, and covalent bonding. Okay, the ionic bonding is the very simplest to explain. All you need is an atom that has lost or gained electrons, and that makes an ion. And when it does that, due to the fact that it has an excess of negatives or a deficiency of negatives, takes on a negative charge or a positive charge, respectively. So it has to have a complete charge. <clears throat> and then once you have that, the positives attract the negatives, and that's your bond. Uh, think sodium chloride. Right. Sodium and chlorine, if they're neutral, they have the same number of protons and the same number of electrons. Sodium will have uh, 11, excuse me, 11, and chlorine will have 17. Protons and electrons balance, neutral. Okay. Sodium's metal. Metals have a tendency to give up electrons when they react with other elements. So sodium is going to lose one electron, which makes it a positive ion. 
So now we only have 10 electrons for that ion. That gives it an excess of one proton. Chlorine is a nonmetal. Nonmetals tend to accept electrons. So chlorine would accept an electron given a negative charge, and now it has 18 electrons. You can look at it as a transfer. So this sodium loses an electron, transfers it to chlorine, and now you have uh, a positive ion and a negative ion, and that electrostatic attraction is what holds them together as a compound. Okay, by comparison, covalent bond is one in which electrons are only shared. They're not completely transferred from one atom to another. And these types of bonds occur between two nonmetals. So the ionic bond is between a metal and a nonmetal. But the covalent bond occurs between two nonmetals. So, and you know where those occur on the periodic table. You've got that black line that uh, is the demarcation between nonmetals on this side and metals all over here. So any two of these that form a bond will do so by sharing electrons. That's the covalent bond. And those types of compounds are called molecular. The reason being that they tend to form um, groups of atoms that function as a single unit. Uh, water is a good example. So we get hydrogen together with oxygen. That's a single unit. It behaves as a single unit in uh, all physical encounters. It takes a chemical reaction to break those bonds. Whereas the sodium and the chlorine together um, are electrostatically attracted, but these are, let's see, we give it a name before, ionic compounds. Okay, so these are ionic compounds. These are, excuse me, these are molecular compounds. So sharing ionic, covalent ionic compounds. <clears throat> Of course, like I've often said before, nature just does what it does. And we try to figure it out. And as a consequence, when these bonds form, I think I can say never. No bond is completely 100% one or the other. There's always an electrostatic. Um, there's an, always a, an ionic. Well, there might be some, one exception I can think of. When you put two atoms together of the same element, like two nitrogens together or two oxygens together, it would be hard to, to justify uh, an ionic character to those. But whenever there are two different elements together, you're going to have some ionic character. And if they are both nonmetals, they will definitely have some covalent character. So there's a continuum between the two. You can think of it as a, over here, this is completely ionic. Oops, ah, I won't record that. This is completely ionic. And this is completely covalent. And most activity occurs between the two in terms of bonding. And there's a way to express that mathematically, but that's, that's beyond the scope of this course. Okay. Um, another concept that we need to grasp is the fact that not all the electrons that are in that region outside the nucleus, not all of them are involved in bonding. Only a few, and the ones that are, are called the valence electrons. 
Now it's not, it's not a big mystery which are the valence electrons. I'm going to tell you how to figure out which ones are which. Okay. You have the valence electrons that are involved in bonding and then everything else, which will be closer to the nucleus. Uh, if you have the nucleus here, and the valence electrons are out here, then the rest of the electrons are called core. And they're not involved in bonding, just the valence electrons. Okay. And um, there are certain preferred arrangements of electrons when a bond forms. The preferred, uh, and one way to think of them is this octet rule. I'm not going to define it right now because we're going to develop it in the next few slides. If you've never heard of that, if you had a biology course or an anatomy course, probably the, the chemical component where that they where they breeze across chemistry in the, in the, just a few pages of the textbook, they'll probably mention the octet rule because it's so important and, and central to understanding. Uh, developing an understanding of why certain elements combine the way they do. Okay, uh, an ion bond forms between when one or more electrons are transferred from one atom to another, and that always occurs between metals and nonmetals. Okay, what's a valence electron? It's the one in the outermost. It's any electron in the outermost energy shell. So when we uh, did uh, electron configurations for atoms, and we did do that, I'm not very sure, where we had uh, like 1s2, 2s2, you remember that? 2p6, so forth. Okay, the valence electrons would be in the highest energy level. So all of those, in this case, all of those in this energy level are valence electrons. In this case, it would be eta. That's a bad example. There we go. Because if we had two in this one, that one's full, but this one's got five and it could have six. So it would be like what? One, two, three, four, five. Okay. It's got room for one more. So uh, if we put one more electron in here, what would that do? That would make six, seven, eight, the octet. That's where the octet comes from. <clears throat> and those in the highest energy level are valence electrons. Now, this concept of the octet works best for the representative elements only. And the representative elements are those in the first two columns. First two groups on the left, and the last six on the right. So it would be this group here, and these groups here would be representative elements. And of course, these are transition elements. And it's um, the octet works for these because when you uh, take one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, when you have that octet, your atom looks electronically, it looks like a noble gas. So at that point, it's non reactive. It's attained the octet, it's perfectly happy. We don't include the transition elements in there because how many can you, how many electrons can you have in their outermost shell? Well, if you go all the way over here, you've got two here, six there, and 10 there. So it kind of blows the octet out of the water. So the octet works best for those representative elements. Okay, so um, there was a chemist, um, an American chemist, named G. N. Those are his initials, G. N. Lewis, and he was trying to find a way to represent uh, elements in such a way that he could bring them together on a piece of paper and decide uh, what type of reaction they would have. How would they react? And what he developed was the Lewis symbol. 
we'll do a symbol is simply whatever the symbol for the element is, and then it has eight possible electrons that you can position around it. All right, so there's your octet. Uh, you have you could have a maximum of eight, and you arrange them like that. If you have eight there, then you have a noble gas. But if you have something else, let's use an example. Say you have uh, carbon. Carbon in its valent shell, all you have to do is look to the left of carbon. Okay, there's one, there's two, three, four. So carbon only has four electrons in its valence shell. There you go. That's the way you would write a Lewis dot structure. You don't have to use dots. Most often we do. If you want to compare this element with a different one that you're trying to react, then what you may want to do is say, make that electron an X so you know where it came from. But more often than not, we, we say Lewis dot structures. And this is, these are examples. Notice that all the alkaline metals, including hydrogen, have one dot. They only have one valence electron. The alkaline earths have two valence electrons, boron, aluminum, and that group. They could go on down, but we're going to stop here. Have three, carbon has four, five, six for oxygen, seven for fluorine, and eight for the noble gases. And notice in the older system where you uh, identify the columns with symbols rather than names. When you use the Roman numeral sys system, the number, the Roman numeral, is how many valence electrons you have. So when you get over to the 8A, they all have eight valence electrons. Um, so all the representative elements have columns of uh, Roman numeral A's, and all the transitions have Roman numeral B's. So they're, they're not as useful. Those Roman numerals are not as useful in here. They, they can give you some information, but uh, I, let's focus on just the A's. So the Roman numeral A's tell you how many valence electrons there are. Now that's okay if you've got an older periodic table with the Roman numeral system in there, as well as the new IUPAC system where it goes one to 18. <clears throat> Okay, um, how about the number of valence electrons in each of the following elements? Okay, where's calcium? Calcium is an alkaline earth, so it has two valence electrons, right? There we go. And we can also say, what orbital are they in? I mean, what's the, the, the valence shell uh, configuration? It's 4s2. Notice that it's in the fourth period. So that's uh, 4s1, 4s2 is calcium. So that's its valence electron position, 4s2. How about selenium? Let's see, where's selenium? Selenium is right there. Okay, so if we go 4 for calcium, 4s1, 4s2, now we go over here and start with 3p, uh, 4p. 4p1, 4p2, 4p3, 4p4. Four electrons. Well, I, I should say it has four in the P, but it has two in the S. So it actually has six valence electrons because they both have the same principal quantum number. And carbon, we just did. It has two in the S orbitals and two in the P's. Okay. Oops. Okay, um, I think I've covered all these points. If you're in the same group, then all of your neighbors in that group have the same number of valence electrons. And they're equal to that Roman numeral in number. Um, and the maximum number of valence electrons you can have is eight. With qualification, because that's only good for um, 
discussing representative elements. It works a large part of the time. It works all the time when you're in when you're in the uh, second and third and yeah, second and third period. The octet works perfectly because there are no d orbitals to deal with there. Then it gets a little sketchy once you get down into the into the three Ds. How about the Lewis dot structure for these elements? Oxygen, where is oxygen? Oxygen is right here. So it has two, one, two, three, four, five, six. Oxygen has six. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. So what does that tell you about its reactivity? That tells you that these paired electrons don't want to react. But these two do want to react. So that's why oxygen tends to form two bonds with any other atoms. In the case of water, it forms one bond with hydrogen, it forms another bond with that hydrogen. And while we're here, a uh, stream of consciousness, this line represents a bond, and that single bond is formed from two electrons. One electron from here and one electron from hydrogen forms that bond. So anytime you see a line between two atoms, it means two electrons. If oxygen forms a bond with itself, which is the way it exists in, in uh, room temperature and one atmosphere pressure, it's a diatomic element. Then we would say, let's do it this way. There we go. Now we'll bring this one on this side. Right? We'll form a bond here and a bond here. So this will have a double bond. So when these two bonds form, two electrons here, two electrons there, then you have these others that are called non-bonding electrons. They're still there. They just don't participate in the bond. Okay. Um, so that was oxygen. Come on. There we go. Phosphorus. Phosphorus is, is uh, a one position to the left of the oxygen group. So it's going to have uh, three unpaired electrons because it's only got five in the outer shell. So it has these three unpaired. And fluorine is just one electron shy of noble gas. So it's only going to have that one unpaired. So when fluorine forms uh, the diatomic element, right, these guys are paired. We form just a single bond with fluorine. Well, the difluorine. You would write it like that. Okay. Um, oh, this, this is a test of knowledge. A valence electron is an electron in the outermost electron shell of an atom. Shorthand method for, developed to represent the number of valence electrons in use was the Lewis, the Lewis symbol of the, the Lewis dot structure. Okay. So um, I pretty much explained this already. It just seemed like it, it flowed naturally to get it first rather than wait for the slide. But basically what it means is when you can form an octet, either by transferring electrons or by sharing electrons, if you can form an octet, then you have a more stable situation. And that's the driving force for reactions. The, the compound after the reaction is more stable than the individual elements before the reaction. In other words, they have a lower energy state. 
And that would be perfectly obvious if you tried to react sodium metal with chlorine gas. It would generate massive amounts of heat. So the energy of the individual sodium and chlorine is one level. And then once you bring them together, they have less energy. So where did that energy go? You can't create it. You can't destroy it. So it leaves the system as heat. Now there's one exception, hydrogen, right? It's only got one S1, so it only needs one electron. So this one is the duet rule. It's special for hydrogen. The rest of them are octets, but hydrogen's a duet. So when hydrogen comes together in bonds, right, it only forms a single bond because that's all it has to go on. There we go. <clears throat> okay. Um, and it bears repeating. What they're tending toward is the noble gas configuration. So whether you transfer electrons like we did with sodium and chlorine, or you share electrons like we do with water, you're tending toward noble gas. So in water, the, the um, oxygen is going to look like what? Oxygen is going to look like neon. Okay, starts out with uh, eight electrons, and then we add two more, and it looks like neon. And then hydrogens start out with one electron, and they gain an electron. Now they've got to do that. They look like uh, helium. So electronically speaking, these two look like helium and oxygen looks like neon. Now we didn't add any electrons and you can't count up the electrons like two, four, 14. You don't have 14 electrons in there. You still have only eight here, two there, 10. But if I can say this, anthropomorphize the elements, they feel like they have the octet or the duet. And they look like, uh, electronically speaking, they look like noble gases. Okay. So we mentioned the ions. You have to have a complete transfer of electrons to make an ion. So that electron that's transferred doesn't belong to me anymore. It belongs to that other element. If I'm sodium, I transferred an electron to chlorine. Now, I am a cation, and all positive ions are called cations, and all negative an anions are called, uh, all negative ions are called anions. And just a reminder, when you make an ion, don't mess with the protons. If you change the number of protons, you get a different element. Okay, so this is just the artist's idea. It, this probably came straight out of your book uh, when you transfer electrons. Um, we've already discussed sodium and chlorine and the transfer of electrons. Sodium starts out with an extra electron in its uh, 3s orbital, and it transfers that electron to chlorine, and it goes into chlorine's 3p orbital. And notice, they have drawn somewhat accurately here. Uh, the atomic size of the sodium neutral sodium atom is would be something like that. Once it loses the electron, it shrinks because there's no nothing occupying that space out there, so it gets smaller. In chlorine, we add an electron, it gets bigger. All right, so when you add an electron, the size of the ion. The anion is bigger than the neutral atom. And when you subtract an electron, the size of the cation is smaller than the neutral atom. And I think we've got a, a representation coming up. When you put these two together, uh, well, we've got to do this slide first. A uh, chemical symbol for each of the ions. The ion formed in a potassium atom loses one electron. Well, you just write it like this. 
loses one electron, right? Makes it positive. Or the sulfur, when it gains two electrons, it's like that. Now, is that true? This is an alkali metal? Yeah. It's only got one electron to lose. If it loses an electron, what does potassium look like then? We just back up one. Looks like argon, right? It has the electronic configuration of argon. Whereas sulfur is here, it's easier to lose one electron than it is to gain however many to get the krypton. <laughs> that would be a massive uh, energy transfer. It's simpler just for potassium to lose an electron. Now it looks like argon. Or for sulfur, it's easier for sulfur to gain two electrons than it is to uh, lose six electrons. It looks like neon. Gain two electrons, it looks like argon. So these both look like argon, electronically speaking. Okay. Um, so we can we can form ions by losing by gaining or losing electrons, and we can form ions. We can form cations. We can form anions. All of those are possibilities for ionic bonding. Okay. Um, I think we've covered this topic well enough already. This just shows you the electronic configuration of sodium ion. No, it doesn't. Because we need to lose that electron. Is it going to do that? Yes. Okay. So actually, it should have said sodium here, neutral atom is that, and then sodium ion is this one, and it looks like neon. That could be a little misleading because if it's an ion, it doesn't have that. It's lost that electron. And then for, uh, oh, the point here is that, the point I've already made, it's easier to lose one electron than it is to gain seven. So that, that's what sodium would have to do to gain an electronic configuration like argon. It would have to gain seven electrons. And it just doesn't happen. Not for metals. They tend to lose electrons to get where they want to go. Okay. Um, all right. So now that we know why elements gain and lose electrons, the trend is for the, this group, alkali metals, they always form a plus one charge. Lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, they all form a plus one charge when they uh, bond with non-metals. The second group, alkali and earth, have a two plus charge when they form ions. Aluminum has a three plus charge. And in fact, gallium and indium also, in that same group, gallium and indium have a three plus charge. Sometimes boron will form an ion. And it's one of those, uh, it's right on the line, right? So we could call it a metalloid. Sometimes it acts like a metal, sometimes it acts like a non-metal. When it acts like a metal, it forms that three plus charge. If it acts like a non-metal, it'll form a covalent bond. If it acts like a metal, it'll form, it'll do the three plus charge and bond that way. On the other side, if we start from the noble gases and move to the left one, now we've added an electron in order to make the ion. So fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, and astatine, for that matter, are all halogens, and they form a minus one charge. These trends are important when you start to write compounds. Because if you know what the charge is supposed to be, then you can uh, 
put the right number of ions together to make a neutral compound. That's where we're headed. <coughs> Next door to that are the calcogens, oxygen group. Oxygen, sulfur, selenium, tellurium, they all form two minus charge. And then to the left of them, <coughs> the nitrogens, nitrogen, phosphorus, arsenic, antimony, they all form uh, three minus charges. Actually, it gets a little squirrelier in here. And you'll notice in the periodic tables, they're going to show you more than one charge next to those atoms. Okay, that can be confusing. Now, we're only talking about ions here. There's another concept called oxidation state. And we'll use that later. But um, it allows for covalent bonding and tracking electrons. So we're not going to focus on it right now. We're just going to say that if you, form, if you form an ion from nitrogen, it's going to be three negatives. Carbon group. They can go either way, right? Because they've got four valence electrons, they can either add four or subtract four. And so it depends on the environment as to whether carbon, silicon, germanium, whether they go positive or negative. Uh, if carbon is bonded with a metal, it usually goes uh, negative. So let's see, it's a good example. Calcium carbide. So with calcium carbide, this would form a two plus. This would be a four minus. That means we need two of these to give you the four pluses to balance that four minus. So calcium carbide would be CA2C. And that's what miners used to put in their headlamps. They put some calcium carbide up there. That was before electricity. They put some calcium carbide up there and add water to it. And the reaction of calcium carbide water produces acetylene gas. Then they would light the flame, and that acetylene gas would burn, and they could see what they're doing underground. And just hope they didn't hit a gas pocket or uh, build up too much coal dust, because then it would blow up in their face. So that's why we don't use those lamps anymore underground. We went to electricity. Okay. So I mentioned earlier that uh, these elements are tending toward, they try to form noble gas configurations. Well, if all of them do, say if um, fluorine looks like neon and oxygen looks like neon and nitrogen looks like neon, when they react, when they gain those electrons, they all have the same electronic configuration. It looks like neon. That's called an isoelectronic series. All of them have exactly the same electronic structure. Um, and these are examples, right? Nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine. And then if you go down to sodium and lose an electron, magnesium lose an electron, aluminum lose three electrons, then they all look like this. They all look like neon. That's an isoelectronic series. Now, they don't all... We don't have to form a series from uh, those that look like a noble gas, but that's the most common. You could form an isoelectronic series from other elements as long as they have exactly the same electronic configuration, they're an isoelectronic series. Iso means same. You ever play with those little, those little bugs with all the legs on them? And you touch them and they go, they roll up into a ball, call them roly polies, right? Those are called isopods. Pod means foot. They have the same foot. All their feet look exactly alike. So that's what iso means. The same electronic configuration. Okay. Um, neon magnesium two plus. Neon has uh, an atomic number of 10, which means 10 protons and 10 electrons, and a neutral charge. Whereas magnesium ion has 12 protons, an atomic number of 12, 12 protons, 
but only 10 electrons that gives it two plus charge. This is where they're identical right here. Same number of electrons. Okay, concept check. Choose an alkaline metal, alkaline earth, and a noble gas and a halogen so that they constitute an isoelectronic series. When the metals and the halogen are written as their most stable ions, we can pick any one of those noble gases. Uh, let's say um, argon. Right? Neutral. So what if we add an electron to, to argon? We're going we're gonna to go to chlorine. Right? Go one left. And then we get, um, let's see, I'm going to run out of space here. Sulfur. 18 protons. Uh, excuse me. Sorry. 16 protons. And then two extra electrons makes it look like argon. If we go the other direction and we subtract electrons, then we're gonna go back to uh, potassium, which starts out with nitrine electrons, but we take one away. So we have the same number of electrons as argon. Did. And then let's go one more, say uh, calcium. Calcium has 20 protons. 20 electrons, but we want a two plus charge. So that means we need 18 electrons like that. So the number of electrons for this series would be exactly the same as the number of protons of argon. And that gives them these charges. That's an electronic series. Let's see, which one did they pick? Yeah, okay. I went two more, one on the outside. <clears throat> each end. Okay. Oh, I didn't write the electronic configuration. If they're going to be the same electronic configuration, then we just follow along, right? Argon is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. So that's 6, 10. I need 8 more. 3s2, 3p6. There we go. So that's the electronic configuration for this one and everybody in the series. And they all have 18 electrons, but different numbers of protons. Okay. If they have different number of protons, you get a different element. All right. Um, Magnesium ion, what's the electronic configuration of magnesium ion? Magnesium, let's see, where is it? It's an alkaline metal, alkaline earth with 12 protons, but it loses two of those to look like neon. So now it's gonna have a 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, that's 10, and a three, Oh, no. it lost those two, the three S2, they're gone. So this is what it's gonna look like here. Here we go, I can't see. There it is, one S2, two S2, two P6. And that's neon, right? 10 electrons, 10 protons for neon. That's neon, or, that's the magnesium ion because it has the same number of electrons. Okay. Um, actually, I think we're deep beating a dead horse here. We've already covered how do you form ions? You transfer electrons from a metal to a non metal, and then they bond by electrostatic attraction. So, there's nothing new in this slide. Um, the Lewis structure can show transfer of electrons. That's what this arrow means. This electron was transferred to chlorine. Now we have a deficiency here of one and an excess here of one, and that's where the bond forms. Um, sodium and oxygen, how about that? 
Sodium is an alkali metal that only has one electron in the valence shell. So this sodium transfers one electron here. This one transfers another one. So now oxygen has a complete octet and sodium, well, it shows the missing all its electrons, but underneath it has a complete octet. Only it's not in the 3S now, it's in the 2S. 2S2, 2P6 would be sodium's outer, but it's deficient by one electron each. That's why we have two sodiums and one oxygen. We balance the charges. Right? We have a plus and a plus makes two pluses balanced with a two minus. All your ionic compounds must balance to charges. Calcium chloride. Right? Calcium is an alkaline earth. It can form a two plus charge. Chlorine's and a halogen with a one minus charge each, so you need two of them. So a two plus from calcium combines with two one minuses from chlorine, and that's why calcium chloride is written this way, to balance the charges. Okay, definition of a Lewis structure. It represents Uh, Lewis structure is a combination of Lewis symbols. Now, we talked about, um, actually I introduced you to a little bit of it. The Lewis structure for an individual atom has the valence electrons positioned around the symbol. But once you form a compound with those, you can write a Lewis structure for the compound itself. Okay. Let's see, are we gonna do that? Right. right, we're still beating that dead horse. Ionic compounds are always neutral. And you just ratio the ions so that you get neutrality. All right, when we write the, the compounds, we're gonna start with ionic compounds and move into covalence using some of the things we've learned from the ionic compounds. You put the positive ion first. So you always write like that, positive negative, cation, anion. And these are for binary compounds. Binary means two. So we got two, we've got a cation and an anion. Cation always goes first. And you don't show the charges when you write the compound. Now, when you're balancing them, you know, it's perfectly all right to say, that's a positive, that's a negative. Okay, they're balanced. But when you represent them as the formula for an ionic compound, you just write it that way. And any competent chemist can tell you what the charge on that one is, and the charge on that one. Because this position, it has to be positive, this position has to be negative, then, well, it's either, that the charges have to balance, but to know what the charge is, you know their position in the periodic table. Alkali metals are all plus one. Halogens are always minus one. If you need any subscripts, then that tells you how many of each one, and the subscript times the charge is the one that has to be balanced by the other. For instance, if we have sodium and phosphorus together, Sodium is a plus one charge. Phosphorus is in the group in the nitrogens where it has three minus charge. So you know that this one is three minus, that one is one plus. We need three sodiums to balance the phosphorus. So that's the ratio in this ionic compound. Okay, how about these? Chemical formulas. If we just, we're gonna, just gonna give you the charges. Now notice that um, this one comes from transition metals, and this one is a is a, a metal, but possible of multiple charges. We're telling you what the charge is for this exercise. For this one, you have uh, a barium, and you're going to need two chlorines to balance the charge. Okay. For this one, you've got a three plus and a two minus. How do we deal with that?
and a 2 minus. Best way is cross multiply. Just take that 2 and put it over here, and take that 3 and put it over here. So we got 3 times 2 is 6 minus. 2 times 3 is 6 plus. We're balanced. And then for uh, lead with a 4 plus charge and oxygen with a 2 minus, you need two oxygens to balance that 4 plus. How about the combination of aluminum and chlorine? You need three chlorines, right? To balance that three plus from aluminum. One aluminum, one aluminum and three chlorines. Aluminum. Well, we haven't got to name it yet. So I'm not gonna spoil it for you. Okay. What is it about these ion compounds that they have in common? Well, they consist of individual ions. So you really can't say that it's just this one and this one together, that's it. It doesn't work that way. When you have individual ions form, they form an ionic crystal, a network of interacting positive and negative charges. This just happens to be the simplest ratio of sodium and chlorine. Actually, in the sodium, Chloride crystal, you ever spill table salt on the table and look at it with a magnifying glass? Really? Okay. Oh, good. For the longest time, I used that in class and nobody's ever done that before. So, what's the matter? You're not curious. So you get a magnifying glass and look at the crystal. What is it? It's a cube, right? It's a cube. So we have. This uh, positive surrounded by negatives, there'll be one behind and one in front. Okay. And then this negative is surrounded by positives. One in front, one behind. And they form a network. So if you if you looked at the actual ratio of sodium to chlorine, it would be uh, this sodium would be surrounded by six negatives, but that one would be surrounded by six positives. So actually what you got is like that. But for ionic compounds, we simplify to the smallest whole number ratio. That's why it's just NaCl. I think there's a slide coming up for that too. <clears throat> Here we go, it's the very next one. So this is kind of a three-dimensional arrangement and you see the sodium ions in here, they lost an electron, so they're small. Chlorine gained an electron, so it's bigger. Uh, plus it's in, they're separated on the periodic table. So you can see here that this sodium is surrounded by six chlorines and this chlorine is surrounded by six sodiums. They form a network. This is the two dimensional, it's like a slice through that. Okay, so for that reason, um, it's not proper to say that this is the molecular formula of chlorine. It's not. That is a formula unit. It's the smallest unit of sodium and chlorine in that crystal. When we say molecular formula, we're actually implying that there's a bond in there that separates those atoms in their unit from all others. That's the molecular formula. This is a formula unit, smallest whole number ratio. Another example. So the smallest ratio is just one sodium and one chlorine. And you can tell that from the charge. Okay. Um, let's see, one second. Okay, so if we're gonna talk about just metals, only metals, which means these are metals 
That's not metal. This is not metal. Um, this would be a, a non metal metal and then a non metal metal. If we're just talking about metals, oh, that side of the black line, these are the standard charges. All these alkali metals, and we exclude hydrogen because it's not a metal. Right? That's, that's key here, the metallic elements. These are all plus one, these are all plus two, these are plus three. And then there are three transition elements that have a single charge. Zinc is two plus, cadmium is two plus, and silver is a one plus. Those are important when we start naming compounds that you know that these are fixed charges for metals. Right, that'll become obvious when we get to that part. Oops. So when we start naming compounds, we're going to use a binary format. In other words, uh, one cation and one anion element, and how do they interact? What's the charge balance? But we're going to use what we learned with uh, the metal non metal binary ionic compounds and use some of those rules to inform naming covalent compounds, those that are bound together by sharing electrons. Okay, so type one compounds. These are type ones. They're metal, non-metal. Okay, and the metal is a fixed charge. Always a fixed charge. When you say sodium, we know that's a plus one charge, no other possibilities. Or we say calcium, that's a two plus charge, no other possibilities. That's essential for the type of one. Because when we name them, the first thing you say is the cation. So we would say sodium. And then the anion, you take the name and change the ending to IDE. So we say chloride. And that's all you have to say. Two rules in chemistry, particularly for naming compounds. It needs to be unambiguous. In other words, when I say that name, there's no other possibility but this. Can't be anything else. Unambiguous and not redundant. So I'll show you what redundancy means in the next title. So that's all you have to say. And we know that it's this because the charge is balanced. Sodium ion, chloride ions, we know. No other possibility. Um, let's see. So uh, bromine will be bromide. Carbide, if the carbon is a negative charge, it's combined with a metal, it's carbide, like our calcium carbide example. Chlorides, fluorides, even hydrides. When hydrogen combines with a metal, it uh, acquires a negative charge. Uh, iodide, nitride. So we sort of fudge on some of these because it sounds better. Instead of nitrogide, it just didn't sound right. So this is nitride, this is oxide, phosphide, sulfide. Those would be the endings, the changed endings for these non-metals in an ionic compound. So this would be potassium chloride. Potassium only has one possible charge. Magnesium only has one possible charge. Bromine is minus one, so two of them required to balance the two plus. Magnesium bromide, calcium oxide. These are the uh, formula units for those compounds, and these are the names that go with it. And that's all we have to say. 
Right? We can go either direction. If we know this compound, we can write the name. If we know the name, we can write the compound. So that's type ones. Type twos next? Yes. Type two. Metal, non-metal. Variable. Metal charge. So if we have a metal that can that can acquire uh, two or more different charges, depending on the reaction, right? It's not that you can form a compound with a metal that can change its charge while it's in the compound. It doesn't do that. It could have different charges for different compounds. So most of those come from the transition metals. There are a few down here in this metal region that have multiple charges, two or more. So what do we do? Well, to be unambiguous, we have to say what the charge is. If you don't know what the charge is, you can't balance and write the compound correctly. So in order to do that, we insert in parentheses next to the metal, in Roman numerals, the charge of the ion. So our example before was this one, right? And in that case, we have iron three. It's a three plus charge, chloride. There we go. So that's an unambiguous name for that compound. Now back to the topic of redundancy. If we said um, sodium, one, chloride, that's redundant. We know sodium is a plus one charge. Can't be anything else. So we don't write it that way. That's redundant. It's unambiguous just to say sodium chloride. Okay. Um, now, the transition metals that are fixed charge, zinc two plus, cadmium two plus, silver one plus. Those would fit into the type one compounds because they only have one possible charge. So if we said, um, Instead, if we said this, silver chloride, we would not have to say what the charge is on silver because it's only one possible charge. And then we would write it plus one minus one. That's it. Okay. Type one, type two. You may have already guessed there's a type three. Oh, we got to get through some examples first. Okay, so copper is a one plus. And copper could be a one plus or a two plus. So we do have to say what copper is. In this case, copper has to be a one plus. Why? Because there's only one of them. In bromine, we know bromide is a minus one. It's a halogen. It has to be a minus one. So the copper has to be a plus one since there's only one of them. So that's how we would write it, copper one bromide. Um, iron and sulfur. Sulfides are all two minuses. So this one iron has to be a two plus. No other possibility. Iron two sulfide. And lead four oxide, because this one is oxygen with a two minus charge. Two times two is four, four minus. So that one lead has to be four plus to balance the charge. All right. Polyatomics. What is a polyatomic? A polyatomic, poly means many, it has many atoms, but they're bound together in such a way that they behave as a single ion. 
And you can't you can break them apart, but when we write them in a compound, they behave as a single ion. Uh, example: How about in this chart, this table is constructed. Uh, this list of polyatomics is exactly the same as this one. This one is sorted by name. So it's an alphabetical order by the name. This one is sorted by the compound. So it's going to be in a different order. Just depends if you want to find what the polyatomic ion is based on its name. So you're looking, you're reading the name of a compound. Or if you know, if you see the compound formula, you want to find out how to name it, then you go to this one. But polyatomics all have fixed charges associated with that group of, of atoms. And in fact, the polyatomics are covalently bound groups of atoms, and they behave as a single unit. And the charge that's assigned to them is distributed over the entire group. It's not located on any one atom. So that means when you write the polyatomics in a formula, if you need more than one of them, you have to use a parenthesis and a subscript to say you need more than one. You can't change the subscripts of a polyatomic. So if we have, um, uh, let's use an example, say uh, nitrate. That if you need more than one of them, you do this. You don't go in here and say, two and six, and that makes this one two. It doesn't work that way. Because they behave as a single unit. Okay, so what do you do with the polyatomics? Well, notice that all of them except one are negatives. So they will fit into the non-metal side of your binary compound. There's only one of them that's a positive, ammonium. That goes into the cation side. So we've got some examples to work with here. Um, oh, I don't have a copy of your textbook, but it's supposed to be table 2.5 on page 65 in your text. Table 2.5, that's like chapter two. We're already in chapter four. Better check me on that and see if it's there. So here are some examples. Hydroxide is a polyatomic ion. It only has two atoms together that function as a unit. The hydroxide is, and these names don't change. Right? For the polyatomics, this is hydroxide. If you need a nitrate, it's called nitrate. You don't change it to IDE, it's just nitrate. Sulfate, that's a sulfate. And then ammonium. So here's a, a binary compound with two polyatomics in it, the ammonium and the sulfate together. The sulfate is a two minus charge. And ammonium is a one plus charge. So you need two of them to balance the charges. So the rule still holds. It's just now we've got groups of atoms. Okay, type three. Let's see. Let's see. We'll make a three here. Type threes are between nonmetals and nonmetals. That's not nitrogen, that's nonmetal. Non non. <clears throat> By definition, two nonmetals together can't make ions. Uh, because who's going to get the electrons? The nonmetals tend to attract electrons to themselves. So if they're both attracting electrons, they need somewhere in the middle. So you get a covalent bond. They share electrons. But we're going to use what we've learned from the type one and type two to name binary nonmetal type three compounds. Um, the trick is deciding which one comes first because neither one of them are metals, right? They don't form cations. So the rule of thumb 
is the one that's to the left. If you have two of them come together, the one that's to the left is typically takes the cation position. So if we have nitrogen and oxygen, nitrogen is to the left of oxygen. It would be that way. And then we would say, how many of them are there? Well, here's an example. Okay. Now, these are not balanced by charges because they don't have charges. They're covalently bound. So you, just, you have to know, you have to be given that information because it could be this one. 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 You don't know. <clears throat> that one happens to be laughing gas, nitrous oxide. So how would we name them? Well, for type three compounds, you simply have to say how many of them there are. How many atoms of each element are in that unit? This is a molecule. It behaves as a single unit. So we use the Greek prefixes. Um, let's see, I think they're on the next page. Here we go. Mono for one, di, tri, tetra, penta for five, hexa, hepta for seven, octa for eight, nona for nine, and deca for 10. Those are your Greek prefixes, and you need to know those to do type threes. Uh, okay. So for this one, we would say dinitrogen. Monoxide. That tells us we have two nitrogens and one oxygen together. So we could write this from that, or we could write that from that. <clears throat> the thing about it is, if we had, uh, let's write it this way. Let's say instead of that one, we have this one. That would definitely be dioxide. Okay? But if the first one in the metal, the cation position is single, we don't say mono. So that's one exception where you, you don't say mono in the first position. So we wouldn't say mononitrogen, we just say nitrogen. Okay. So that's how you name type three compounds. You just say how many there are. Everybody knows carbon dioxide. It's named that way because it's a type three compound. One carbon, two oxygens. Sulfur hexafluoride or dinitrogen tetroxide is N2O4. So in many respects, this is the easier one. The trick is trying to figure out which one comes first. Let's see, carbon is left of oxygen, that's good. Sulfur is below and to the left of fluorine, that's good, it occupies the cation position. Nitrogen is to the left of oxygen. So those all three obey that rule of thumb. There are occasions when they're reversed, but most often, uh, if you're back into a corner and you have to decide to the left and below or to the left, it's the metal position. Now, how do you decide? Because we've got these individual rules, but what if you're given on a test a, a list of compounds and you got to name them? You need a way to decide which one is which. So you look down and you say, okay, which one, does this one have a metal in it? Yeah, it's definitely got a metal. Okay, so it's a type one or type two. Then you have, need a tiebreaker. So you look, where does that metal come from? If it's an alkaline metal, it's an alkaline earth, it's in the boron group, aluminum, gallium. If it's zinc, silver, cadmium, then it's a type one because it has a fixed charge. Otherwise, it's a type two, and then you need your Roman numeral, okay? If they're both non-metals, you go immediately to type three and just say how many there are. And that extra credit with uh, 50 
uh, names. That's a mixture. Some of them are names and some of them are compounds. So if it's a name, you write the compound for the answer. And if it's a compound formula, you write the name for your answer. And those, if I haven't said before, those um, extra credits are worth about a quarter of an exam. But both of them together are half an exam. So you can make up a good bit of ground that way. Uh, okay, so that's your decision tree for naming compounds. Uh, polyatomics. Well, if you've got polyatomics in there and they're in the um, you, you name them, you name compounds with polyatomics with a type one or a type two convention. Because if you've got polyatomics in there, you definitely have ions. Right? You don't have a type three situation. So polyatomics always mean type one or type two, depends on the metal. Okay. All right. Now for the last one. So we can all start. Well, I don't have any more hair to pull out, but you might have some. Acids. We have a special convention for naming acids that was inherited from pre-modern times. So we sort of had to fit it into the, the system. Okay, first of all, recognizing an acid. When you see a compound written and it starts with a hydrogen, it's a very good chance that it's an acid and it can have anything on this end. In fact, this X could have other hydrogens in it, yeah. however many. We put, we put the hydrogen first in an acid because when you dissolve that compound in water, that, ass, that hydrogen has the potential to dissociate. It leaves the molecule and reacts with water. And that forms the acidic character, the dissociated hydrogen. So this example, this first example is HCl. That. Now, how would we name that by our normal convention? We would say hydrogen chloride. And that's the way you would name it if it were the pure compound. HCl as a gas is the pure compound, and that's the way you would name it. But if you dissolve it in water, and the, the uh, identifier here is AQ for aqueous. So we could have gas, L for liquid, S for solid, or AQ for aqueous. If it's aqueous, now we name it like an acid. <clears throat> and we need some rules for that. And we're going to get to them in just a second. Um, let's see. Okay. The first rule is identify your acid. First of all, does it have a hydrogen? Second of all, is it in aqueous solution? And third, does this anion part of the molecule have any oxygen in it? If it has no oxygen in it, then you always start the name with hydro. So we would say hydro. Now what comes next? The second part of the molecule. Uh, hydrogen chloride, the ides become ix. So hydrochloric acid would be the name for that compound. Um, now, if you have an oxygen in here anywhere, in that part of the molecule, you don't use hydro. You go to that part of the molecule, absent the hydrogen, and then you follow rules to name it from there. And that's what we're gonna to get to next. And maybe not coincidentally, but <clears throat> if you've got a, um, an acid made uh, that has oxygen in it, 
that anion part of the molecule is going to be a polyatomic ion. It has to be. Okay. So in this case, these all have oxygens in them. So we don't start with hydro. We look at this part of the molecule right here and here and here. Notice this one has some hydrogens here and some hydrogens there. That's the one that dissociates. These guys are stuck. They cannot leave. So we look at what is this part of the molecule? Well, that's a polyatomic ion and it's called nitrate. So when we make an acid out of it, and we didn't write the aqueous in here, so we're, you have to bear with me. Assume that it's an aqueous solution. So the ACEs become X. So that means nitrate becomes nitric acid. Okay? This one is sulfate, is the polyatomic here. ACEs become X, except we modify it just a little bit so it sounds better. Instead of uh, sulfic, we say sulfuric. So this is sulfuric acid. And then acetic is formed from acetate. So if you look in that table, you'll find the acetate ion is C2H3O2 minus one charge. And in all these acids, the hydrogens have a plus one charge. That's given. <clears throat> so acetate becomes acetic. Drop the eight, add IC. So acetic acid is this one. Everybody knows acetic acid. Maybe you don't realize it. 5% acetic acid is vinegar. Okay. All right. Um, so in this case, if the polyatomic ends in ITE, that translates into OUX. Instead of eights become X, ites become buses. So NO2 is nitrite, NO3 is nitrate, NO2 is nitrite, and ite becomes us. So it's nitrous acid. This is sulfite becomes sulfurous, and this is uh, chloride becomes chlorous acid. Okay. Um, one thing about those polyatomics that I, I failed to mention, there are groups of polyatomics. And if you learn the way that they progress, uh, you can get a handle on some of those groups um, without having to just rote memorize them. For instance, the ones that are com combinations of chlorine and oxygen. So I start with this one. Right? That one is the chlorate polyatomic ion. If I take away an oxygen from that, then I can get this. Still one charge, negative charge. This one is chloride. Right? Like that. Take another one away. Now we don't have any more suffixes that work. We have to use a prefix in addition. We use hypochloride. Chloride. So it's underneath the chloride. Right? Hypodermic needle is underneath the skin. This is underneath the chloride. Hypochloride. And then we can go up one. And we need another prefix for that one. This one is per chlorate. Okay. So there you have a family. And you can do this. This is with the chlorine. You can do it with the iodine, per iodate, iodate, iodite, hypoiodite. You can do it with um, bromine. 
perbromate, bromate, bromate, hypobromate. Okay, so you can get a, you can get, well, let's see. But fluorine doesn't fit this model. Only chlorine, bromine, and iodine do this. So that's uh, 12. You can get 12 of them right then. You just know this pattern. And then if you add hydrogens in front of each one and make acids out of them, okay, this becomes eight becomes X perchloric acid. And this one becomes chloric acid. And this one becomes chlorous acid. And this one becomes hypochlorous acid. Okay. There's a pattern here. Um, if you react this with, um, actually you react chlorine gas with sodium, um, you get sodium hydroxide. You get sodium hypochlorite, sodium hypochlorite, like that. So this is minus one, this is plus one. Sodium hypochlorite, everybody knows what that is. But now I think they go up six, six and a half percent. That's bleach. Sodium hypochlorite in water is bleach. Chlorine bleach, I should say. Not the non-chlorine. The non-chlorine bleach is, is a peroxide. That's a different story. It's gentler on your clothing. <clears throat> okay, so let's continue. So here's your decision tree. Does it contain oxygen in the anion? If no, then you proceed with hydro and then you take the anion root and change the ending to ic. Um, if it does have oxygen, then you look at the ending. Is it an eight or an eight? And then you also have to consider those prefixes. Uh, perchloric acid, I forgot to mention that. Right. Perchloric acid is nasty. It is extremely strong. And if you use it improperly, you could have a, a major accident. We used to use it in the lab regularly, but we treated it with respect and we used the proper procedures. We used it for digesting plant material. It would destroy the organic and leave behind the ash very effectively. But before we use this 70% uh, perchloric acid, we pre digested with nitric acid, which was also 70% come to think of it. So we add that to our, our beaker of plant material that we had weighed out beforehand and put it under the hood and pull the sash down and go home for the night and come back the next morning. It will be partially digested. We can add this to it and be safe. <coughs> Um, which of these is named incorrectly? Okay, let's see. What do we have here? We've got a polyatomic that's a minus one charge and a fixed charge metal, right? So it's a type one compound. Potassium nitrate. That's all you have to do. This is the nitrate polyatomic. You don't have to change the ending on polyatomics. They have their ending and it's um, uh, sacred. You don't touch the ending unless you're gonna make an acid out of it. But when you're just writing the compound, you write the metal and the polyatomic. How about this one? Titanium and oxygen. Oxide is right, titanium is right. Does it need that? Yeah, it's a transition metal. It's right there. And it's not one of these special ones. So yeah, you can assume that it has multiple charge. So that was correct. How about this one? What's SN? Do you remember? Tin. Uh -huh. Yeah. You probably brush your teeth with it every night. Tin stannous fluoride. That's how they get the fluorine into your toothpaste as a, as a uh, tin compound. But this one's not that. This one is tin hydroxide. But hydroxide is minus one, it's four of them. So this one has to be a plus four to balance those four minuses. So that one's correct. 
about um, this one, phosphorus and bromine. Those are both nonmetals. So you go immediately to type three compound, phosphorus, penta, bromide. That's right. And calcium and what's that? Chromate. Chromate is a two minus charge. Calcium is a two plus charge fixed. So calcium chromate is correct. They're all right, aren't they? Oh, I did wrong. And nobody said anything. Did you know I was telling you wrong on this one? Oxygen is two minus. So it has to be four minuses balanced with titanium needs to be a four. Okay. I'd like to say I planned that, but I didn't. I just made a mistake. Rest of them are correct. Okay. Uh, we talked about polyatomic ions and how they're covalently bound groups. So they have to be treated as separate units. So anytime you have more than one, you need a, a uh, uh, subscript outside the parentheses. And that's a good indicator that you have a polyatomic. If you've got this and you need to name it, and you've got more than one, then that's a pretty indi good indication. You need to whip out that list and look it up if you're going to name it. Magnesium nitrate. This one's ammonium sulfate. Ammonium is the name. You don't have to change it. Sulfate is the name. You don't have to change it. Um, here's another one. What's this one? Two polyatomics, right? Ammonium nitrate, right? right? That's your terrorist favorite compound. Ammonium nitrate in those little white prills, and you mix in 6% diesel oil, and you drop a blasting cap or stick a dynamite in your barrel after you mix it up and park it next to the Alfred P. Morrow building in the Oklahoma City and knock it down. It makes a good explosive. In fact, mining companies use it all the time. They put a stick of dynamite in the bottom of the drill holes and then overpack it with ammonium nitrate and it magnifies the blast. I didn't tell you that one either. <laughs> Don't get any ideas. Are we out of time? No, I got to think about it. Oh, okay. Okay. We should be getting close. I hope we get close. Let me see. We got a number on the slide. Yeah. Uh, we got another maybe 10 slides. We should be done before normal quitting time. Okay. Um, I mentioned this in the earlier. Most polyatomics have a negative charge. Ammonium doesn't. I didn't mention hydronium. Hydronium is a special ion that forms when acids are added to the water. And it simply, is, let me use an example. Hydrochloric acid, well, we haven't even done balanced chemical reactions yet, have we? Okay, let me not complicate things. It's just, these are the only two positives. Um, most of the ions contain oxygen, except for, of course, this one. And cyanide is one which does not contain oxygen. So if you put cyanide in a compound, let's make an acid out of it, right? One positive hydrogen, one negative cyanide. So how do we name this one? We don't say hydro because there's no oxygen. I mean, there is no oxygen, so we do say hydro. Um, so we say hydro, and cyanide become I becomes ic, hydrocyanic acid. There you go. But that's if it's in solution. Hydrogen cyanide as a pure compound is a gas, and it's deadly. It's that cyanide molecule right there. Anybody had uh, anatomy and physiology? 
Yeah. So you know about uh, oxygen transport in the blood. It combines with hemoglobin, the iron. Well, if you get cyanide in your blood, it latches onto that iron. It does not let go. So you actually suffocate on a molecular level when cyanide is in your system. That's how it kills. <clears throat> and it kills fast. Um, carbon monoxide does the same thing. It uh, it's a, forms a stronger bond with the iron than oxygen does. Okay, um, that's the most contained oxygen. Two of the negatively charged polyatomic ions have names ending in IDE, and the rest end in eight or ite. And that also doesn't say anything about the prefixes. Sometimes you need a prefix, like the hypo I mentioned earlier. Oops, it's getting old. Um, these positives are in an IUM, ammonium, hydronium. Um, oh, some of them, we talked about families. Some of them are like, say, this is a good example. If you have a sulfate, polyatomic, and if you add a hydrogen to it, The hydrogen you assume is a positive charge, it neutralizes one of those negatives. So now the polyatomic is only a minus one charge. This is a sulfate, this is hydrogen sulfate. Um, phosphate. There's phosphate, add a hydrogen to it. Now it's two minus, hydrogen phosphate. Can add another one. Dihydrogen phosphate is that polyatomic. Okay. <clears throat> Let's see. Um, we know what a polyatomic is. Let's see. Determine the same way as those for ionic compounds. Positive and negative. Okay, that states the obvious. We're balancing charges. These behave as uh, either type one or type two. These would be a type one, type one, type one. If we had um, a metal in here with multiple charges, it'd be type two. And you have to use the Roman numeral to say what the charge is. Okay, I thought we already did this one. We did. I don't know how that slipped in there. Um, okay, let's see if we can do this one. What's the correct formula for ammonium carbonate? This one has a plus one charge, that one has a two minus charge, so we need two of these, right? So we would say ammonium, take it twice, carbonate. Right. And everybody knows carbonate. Right. All, all your pop is made with carbon dioxide forms carbonate when it dissolves in water. Along with some other stuff they put in there. I think they use phosphoric acid. And that's why you can drop a nail into a, a, a can of Coke. And a week later, it's gone. It forms iron phosphate, iron three phosphate. Um, so that's a neat demonstration, but it really doesn't say what Coke does in your body. Because your body is designed to compensate. It's, your body is highly buffered. Okay. Oh, we're just about in. Concept questions. When the concept questions come up, we know we're almost at the end. After placing a soft, lustrous, and malleable material, what does that sound like? Sounds like a metal to me. In a container of yellowish gas, sounds like a non-metal to me. 
a violent reaction occurs in a white crystalline material. You decide to break the rule, never taste chemicals in the laboratory, and you taste salty, which of the following is correct. Well, let's say it's a metal and a non-metal forms a salty, it's probably, oops, this one. Could be sodium, could be chlorine. The key, the chlorine part is yellowish gas. Chlorine is a yellowish gas. Okay, how about this one? Uh, fill in the table with the correct information. Looks like the table's already filled in. Let's see what they're getting at here. Oh, the name, right? Sodium hydrogen carbonate. That's baking soda. On the box, it'll be called sodium bicarbonate. That's a, an a ancient form. Instead of sodium hydrogen carbonate, in fact, when I went to school as a student, they, you had to learn the old way. So we had to say bicarbonate, or we had to say um, bisulfate, or I'm trying to think of others. My, my mind's gone blank. Um, oh, uh, if we had a compound with this one versus this one, this one would be ferric, this one would be ferrous, whatever, like ferrous sulfate or ferric sulfate or ferric chloride instead of iron three. I, I find the new system's better. <clears throat> because this us and it depends on which element it is. So some elements with a one charge and a two charge will be us and it. And that could get to be confusing. So you don't have to learn that. Okay, sodium carbonate, all right. Uh, this one, sodium phosphate. So they want this and this. This is a three minus. This is one plus, so we need Three of those. Right. Let's see. Same phosphate. Oh, I see. One, one, two. This is the order. Okay. So this would be the third one here. Sodium phosphate. Second one is magnesium hydrogen carbonate. That's it. That's all you have to say. Magnesium hydrogen carbonate. Oh, this must be an old slide. Bicarbonate. It is an old slide because they're still using the old system. Uh, and the fourth one, magnesium phosphate. If this is a three minus and that's a two plus, then cross multiply. This would have a three and this one would have a two like that. Right uh, here. Okay. All righty, I think that's it.